We best get rid of or modify the old-fashioned belief of the 19th century that the machine will help lighten man's burden, that it will remain a means to an end, and see the danger that if technology is permitted to follow its own logic, it will become a cancer-like growth, eventually threatening the structured system of individual and social life. Our purpose should not be to see how big a machine we can build. Our purpose is human well-being. We have to put the human being back in first place where he belongs and end it himself, the reason for everything else. We should not serve the economy. The economy should serve us. And it can, marvelously. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I'm here with Diana Nightingale, and what you're about to watch is the official version of the myth of the machine with Earl Nightingale. Diana, what are we about to watch? Well, Lewis Mumford wrote this a long time ago, back in the early 60s, I guess, and it was kind of tucked away in a lot of my files, and I found it one day, and I thought, hmm, what is this? And of course, it was by Earl, so I was eager to listen to it. And you'd think that it was written for today's world. The myth of the machine is about everything that's happening in today's world. It's talking about someday there would be a machine that would take over our thinking. And I mean, it's a, it's amazing. It's really, really amazing. So even though it wasn't written by Earl, it's his um, rendition of it. And it's fabulous. You're going to love it. Enjoy. In the fine book, The Revolution of Hope Toward a Humanized Technology by Eric Fromm, Dr. Fromm points out that a specter is standing in our midst whom only a few see with clarity. It's not the old ghost of communism or fascism. It's a new specter, a completely mechanized society devoted to maximal material output and consumption, directed by computers. And in this social process, man himself is being transformed into a part of the total machine, well-fed and entertained, yet passive, unalive, and with little feeling. With the victory of the new society, individualism and privacy will have disappeared. Feelings toward others will be engineered by psychological conditioning and other devices or drugs which also serve a new kind of introspective experience. This new form of society has been predicted in the form of fiction in Orwell's 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. He goes on to write, perhaps its most ominous aspect at present is that we seem to lose control over our own system. We execute the decisions which our computer calculations make for us. We as human beings have no aims except producing and consuming more and more. We will nothing, nor do we not will anything. And in explaining how it happened, Dr. Fromm says, in the search for scientific truth, man came across knowledge that he could use for the domination of nature, and he had tremendous success. But in the one-sided emphasis on technique and material consumption, man lost touch with himself, with life. Having lost religious faith and the humanistic values bound up with it, he concentrated on technical and material values and lost the capacity for deep emotional experience for the joy and sadness that accompany them. The machine he built became so powerful that it developed its own program, which now determines man's own thinking. Dr. Fromm says, in short, that we have become the prisoners of our own creations. We've seen this in the fact that an innocent nuclear accident could easily trigger the total destruction of much of the modern world. Our technological monsters dare us to make a single misstep, and in other forms they dominate our daily lives. Now, much of it is good. Much of it is a whole lot better than it used to be. Few of us want to return to the world of the 30s and 40s, or even to the 50s. We've learned to like our masters. But we need to be aware of the destructive influences which are a part of living in that kind of world. Lewis Mumford, in his brilliant book, The Myth of the Machine, makes a complete description of what he calls the mega-machine, going clear back to the beginnings in ancient Egyptian and Babylonian societies. I think it is time for us to become aware of the general disillusionment that's growing in the land and understand, as does Dr. Fromm, that we'd best get rid of or modify the old-fashioned belief of the 19th century that the machine will help lighten man's burden, that it will remain a means to an end, and see the danger that if technology is permitted to follow its own logic, it will become a cancer-like growth, eventually threatening the structured system of individual and social life. 
However, as Mumford points out, each one of us, as long as life stirs in him, may play a part in extricating himself from the power system by asserting his primacy as a person in quiet acts of mental or physical withdrawal, in gestures of nonconformity, in abstentions, restrictions, inhibitions, which will liberate him from the domination of the Pentagon of Power. He writes, if I dare to foresee a promising future other than that which the technocrats, the power elite, have been confidently extrapolating, it's because I've found by personal experience that it's far easier to detach oneself from the system and to make a selective use of its facilities than the promoters of the affluent society would have their docile subjects believe. Though no immediate and complete escape from the ongoing power system is possible, least of all through mass violence, the changes that will restore autonomy and initiative to the human person all lie within the province of each individual soul once it is roused. Let me hit that again. Though no immediate and complete escape from the ongoing power system is possible, least of all through mass violence, the changes that will restore autonomy and initiative to the human person all lie within the province of each individual soul once it's roused. Nothing could be more damaging to the myth of the machine and to the dehumanized social order it's brought into existence than a steady withdrawal of interest, a slowing down of tempo, a stoppage of senseless routines and mindless acts. And has not all this in fact begun to happen? When the moment comes to replace power with plenitude, compulsive external rituals with internal, self-imposed discipline, depersonalization with individuation, automation with autonomy, we shall find that the necessary change of attitude and purpose has been going on beneath the surface during the last century, and the long-buried seeds of a richer human culture are now ready to strike root and grow as soon as the ice breaks up and the sun reaches them. If that growth is to prosper, it will draw freely on the compost from many previous cultures. When the power complex itself becomes sufficiently etherealized, its formative universal ideas will become usable again, passing on its intellectual vigor and its discipline, once applied mainly to the management of things, to the management and enrichment of man's whole subjective existence. And Mumford goes on to write, as long as man's life prospers, there's no limit to its possibilities, no terminus to its creativity, for it's part of the essential nature of man to transcend the limits of his own biological nature and to be ready, if necessary, to die in order to make such transcendence possible. Behind the picture of fresh human possibilities I've been drawing all through the myth of the machine, he writes, is a profound truth to which almost a century ago William James gave expression. He said, when from our present advanced standpoint, we look back upon past stages of human thought, we're amazed that a universe which appears to us of so vast and mysterious a complication should ever have seemed to anyone so little and plain a thing. There's nothing in the spirit and principles of science that need hinder science from dealing successfully with a world in which personal forces are the starting point of new effects. The only form of thing we directly encounter, the only experience that we concretely have, is our own personal life. The only complete category of our thinking, our professors of philosophy tell us, is the abstract elements of that. And this systematic denial on science's part of the personality as a condition of events, this rigorous belief that in its own essential and innermost nature our world is a strictly impersonal world, may conceivably, as the whirligig of time goes round, prove to be the very defect that our descendants will be most surprised at in our boasted science, the omission that to their eyes will most tend to make it look perspectiveless and short. Well, the whirligig of time has gone round, and what James applied to science applies equally to our compulsive, depersonalized, power-driven technology. We now have sufficient historic perspective to realize that this seemingly self-automated mechanism has, like the old automatic chess player, a man concealed in the works. And we know that the system is not directly derived from nature as we find it on Earth or in the sky, but has features that at every point bear the stamp of the human mind, partly rational, partly cretinous, partly demonic. 
No outward tinkering will improve this overpowered civilization now plainly in the final and fossilized stage of its materialization. Nothing will produce an effective change but the fresh transformation that has already begun in the human mind. Those who are unable to accept William James' perception that the human person has always been the starting point of new effects and that the most solid seeming structures and institutions must collapse as soon as the formative ideas that have brought them into existence begin to dissolve are the real prophets of doom. On the terms imposed by technocratic society, there's no hope for mankind except by going along with its plans for accelerated technological progress, even though man's vital organs will all be cannibalized in order to prolong the mega-machine's meaningless existence. But for those of us who have thrown off the myth of the machine, the next move is ours, for the gates of the technocratic prison will open automatically despite their rusty ancient hinges as soon as we choose to walk out. By all means, buy and read The Myth of the Machine by Lewis Mumford and The Revolution of Hope by Eric Fromm. Two books which give us better balance, which show us first what has caused the modern malaise, the feeling of powerlessness and hopelessness and purposelessness so prevalent today all about us, and tell us what steps we can take as thinking persons to find the freedom we seek, the new enthusiasm and excitement and hope and purpose we need. Our purpose should not be to see how big a machine we can build. Our purpose is human well-being. We have to put the human being back in first place where he belongs and end it himself, the reason for everything else. We should not serve the economy. The economy should serve us, and it can, marvelously, if we'll turn the tables on it. As Lewis Mumford writes, I have found by personal experience that it's far easier to detach oneself from the system and to make a selective use of its facilities than the promoters of the affluent society would have their docile subjects believe. In explaining the possibility of restoring the social system to man's control, Dr. Eric Fromm bases his hopes on two main factors. The first is that the primacy of man himself be re-injected into the analysis of the whole system based on the assumption that human well-being is the overriding goal. And secondly, the increasing dissatisfaction with our present way of life, its passiveness and silent boredom, its lack of privacy and its depersonalization, and the longing for a joyful, meaningful existence which answers those specific needs of man which he has developed in the last few thousand years of his history and which make him different from the animal as well as from the computer. This tendency is all the stronger because the affluent part of the population has already tasted full material satisfaction and has found out that the consumer's paradise does not deliver the happiness it promised. The poor, of course, have not yet had any chance to find out except by watching the lack of joy of those who, quote, have everything a man could want, end of quote. Our society has done a truly remarkable job. It's no wonder we fell in love with our technological discoveries. Riding in a warm, comfortable automobile on a winter's day is a whole lot better than sitting on the back of a horse. So let's use the automobile. But it's where we're going in the automobile that matters. To watch the official version of Earl Nightingale's The Strangest Secret, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. I'd like to tell you about the strangest secret in the world. Not long ago, Albert Schweitzer, the great doctor and Nobel Prize winner, was being interviewed in London, and a reporter asked him, Doctor, what's wrong with men today? 